This is the ExtraTime.com Friday podcast. I'm Oshin Langan. I hope you're keeping safe and well. Coming up, ExtraTime.com's Dave Donnelly, who was in Tala last night for the Republic of Ireland's 1-0 defeat to Sweden in the World Cup qualifiers. There is such a thing as a good defeat, and this was it. To only lose 1-0 to Sweden is actually a good thing because goal difference could be vital in this group and Sweden will probably put up big scores in their other matches. Isn't it a sickener that they didn't beat us with a moment of magic. It was a poxy own goal that Louise Quinn could do nothing about. Ireland have another game next week. That's away to Finland. And Dave will also talk to us about that. We've got Gavin Pearce on tonight's Extra.ie FAI Cup semi-finals between St. Patrick's Athletic and Dundalk and Bohemians and Waterford. He'll also talk to us about his experiences of the Cup, which were mostly good. He won it three times with Sligo. And he'll chat to us about his Warren Point adventure and coming back from a long-term injury. As well as all that, we've got Graham Hannigan of Castle Knock. They're up against Ballyboden St. Enders in a huge go-ahead Dublin Senior Football Championship quarterfinal this weekend. You can watch that and the rest of the quarterfinals live on Dubs TV. And we've got Colin, Colin Fenley, who'll talk to us about Henry Shefflin taking over the Galway Senior Hurlers. I have to say, I was shocked when I heard the news. As was Colin, who played with uh, King Henry... Uh, for Ballyhale Shamrocks and Kilkenny and he was also managed by Henry at Ballyhale Shamrocks and it's that insight that we're looking for what is Henry like as a manager that's all coming up on the extratime.com Friday podcast but first it is Dave Donnelly who was in Tala last night for the Republic of Ireland's defeat to Sweden Dave um, as I was saying there a couple of seconds ago isn't it a sickener that it was an own goal that cost us the game as opposed to just some moment of quality from Sweden. Yeah, it's exactly it. I, I even was thinking during the day, I was going to, uh, well, during the game, I was going to tweet before before the goal went in. I, I basically, I summed up that the only way Ireland were going to concede if it was a silly mistake. Um, it was even it was even worse than that. It wasn't even a mistake. It was just a freak, a freak thing that happened. Uh, an off-target shot happened to hit Louise Quinn's heel going to the going to the goal um apart from that I don't think Sweden threatened an awful lot. Uh so that's that's the real sickener that you you know you can do everything you want. You can plan for absolutely everything. But if a freak event happens then you just have to hold your hands up and say, you know, I couldn't have done much. More detail from you in just a second, but before that uh, you had a chat with Amber Barrett after the game. Let's hear what she had to say. Like I think when you look at over the last games, when we went on a run, I think it was six or seven defeats. And I think ultimately, yes, we look at the defeat, but you have to also look at the level of opposition we're playing. And like we've played some of the best women's teams in the world, but some of the best women's players in the world. And I think ultimately then for us to really, really step on, it's about matching them and then going that little bit further when we get the opportunity. It didn't happen tonight, but you know, I would say out of the, the games we've played, I definitely think that's the game. Tonight was the game that really showed the improvement that we made as a team. The pressure's on a little bit now after this. Um, does that kind of pressure going into Tuesday, does that kind of bring the best out of you? It does in a way. I think every Irish every Irish team, you know, when there's nobody gives them a chance, that's when they kind of step up into the light. And I definitely think that you know Finland, you know, when the group came out, that everybody looked at Sweden as being the top team in the group. Like we can't we can't take that away. Um, I think then we looked at Finland, but you know the message when the draw came out was. You know we're we're happy with the draw. We have we know how good we are. We know how good the teams are in the draw, and even going to Slovakia and Georgia are going to be really really difficult games. And the fact of the matter is, every team in the group has have to go play away from home and and at home. So I think you know yes, choose is a huge game, but we'll be ready to go. Uh, just uh, in terms of respect, like uh, you see teams giving you so much respect now, and maybe they they wouldn't have a few years ago. Do you feel that yourself? Absolutely. I think that even you know. Um, Magdalene Eriksson spoke after the game. She just said the atmosphere here was brilliant. She said, and she said, go and do something in this group. And to hear that from one of their top players is, you know, it's a huge compliment. And you know, you can tell that they've done their research. I think you could tell from how they defended the corners, how well they looked after Louise Quinn and put so many. You know, they nearly had two on her at times. And I think, as you said a couple of years ago, we wouldn't have got that respect. But I think you know the results a couple of weeks ago. I think people were watching and people said, okay, they, these girls mean business. So that's why I think it's now important that Tuesday is a positive result because then I think people will really start. What was the demeanour of the players after the game? We heard from Amber there. She didn't sound like she was too down, nor should she be, by the way, because even though it was a loss, it was still a good performance, still a good result. It was a mix of the two. I think they were, 
they weren't downbeat by any by any sense of the of the word because they they knew that they had played particularly well. Um, but I think they also thought it was an opportunity missed, which I think anybody who watched the game would say the same thing. Um, I mentioned earlier about it being a freak event. As good as Sweden are, and we spoke about it on Monday in terms of um, in terms of Sweden being the better side, and you know we'd be if we get in the end of the game, it would be because we played particularly well. Unfortunately for us, we did play particularly well and we got nothing out of it. Um, but Sweden in general, they they didn't have an awful lot of clear chances. A lot of it was shots from distance. Um, they didn't look comfortable playing against us, um, despite the fact that, you know, physically they're taller, they're stronger, they're quicker, more powerful. Um, they had a lot of advantages. They're, you know, they're a very good side, but they just didn't have, they didn't really have what it took to break us down until, you know, just a little mistake from Ireland. We committed too high up the pitch and that created the space for Blackstenius to get a bit of um, space in the box. Again, her shot was not a good one. It was off. She's a terrific player, but it was a bad shot. It was off target. It just hit Louise Quinn's heel, went into the net, and you could almost just see the. You, you could see it in the reaction of the players. They were like, "How has this happened?" But they responded brilliantly to it. They came out and they they started. They came out and attacked, and they they gave it a good go. But they just ran out of energy in the end. And it's a positive performance, but I think the players are very disappointed that they know how close they came to a big result, and it just didn't happen. Denise O'Sullivan went off with what looked like an elbow or an arm injury. Do do we know anything about that? Do we know if she's doubtful for the game against Finland in Finland next Tuesday? I think we'll get an update today at some point. Um, Vera's reaction after the game, she said she didn't know. Um, She knows that it doesn't look good. Um, Denise did finish the game holding her elbow. Um, she didn't need treatment. She didn't need to be taken off, but she went straight down the the, the tunnel afterwards and uh, was met by the doctor. So we don't know, but you know, if it's a dislocated elbow, if it's a dislocated shoulder, I don't know what it is just yet. Yeah. I really doubt she'll play um, on Tuesday, and it might put her out for a while. But um, hopefully, it's just a, just an impact injury. Hopefully, it's not too bad, and we'll be we'll be seeing her back very soon. And hopefully, the news is good as we speak. It's very early on Friday morning, so there may be a confirmation today as to whether or not she does or doesn't go to Finland. How big a loss would she be if she isn't part of the squad for that game against the Finns? I. I, I think she's our best player. Um, so obviously it's a massive loss. Um, I think we have two genuinely world-class players, herself and Katie McCabe. Katie um, has been in amazing form for Arsenal, but Denise over the past three, four or five years has just been on that top level of player. One of the genuinely, one of the best players that exists in any team in the world. And so she'll be a huge loss, but the one... One thing I would say is that Megan Connolly put in a massive performance as well alongside her. Megan's been a bit unlucky in the last few years. She's had injuries. She's been in and out of the squad. or Not, not the squad, she's been in and out of the starting team. But she was magnificent yesterday. And I think um, in terms of maybe the, the role that, that uh, Denise plays, I think Megan could fill in there. But obviously you're going to have to... Um, you're gonna have to player have to have a player fill in for Megan as well. I think that'll probably be Jamie Finn, who will move back from from uh, right wing back into the centre. But um, yeah, I think I think we'll we'll cover, but we'll definitely um, you know you you'll always miss a player uh, of world class of which we don't have an awful lot. There was an awful lot of eyes on Brosnan, the goalkeeper, and Lucy Quinn. I think it's fair to say that the two of them passed whatever test they might have been. Um, going through if I can actually that's a really terrible way that I put it but you know what I mean people were looking and going okay was it was this the right call to bring these two in from what we saw yesterday it, it seems to have been the right call it was a brave call particularly with Brosnan um, who I do think is very talented but I she's made she made a big mistake in the Australia game conceding a goal she made a big mistake in the Ukraine qualifier which um uh, last year, which ultimately led to to our elimination from the uh, from the Euros, so I think she was under a bit of pressure. But I have to say, she was really, really good today. Not just in terms of her shot stopping, she didn't have an awful lot of um, 
difficult saves to make, but her command of the box, her positioning, um, everything was brilliant. And she, she really, um, underlined, uh, Vera's, um, I suppose her, her faith in her and Lucy Quinn as well, um, making her first competitive start after a good performance against Australia. I think she stepped it up as well. She had a, a really good chance early in the second half. Um, you know, it, she, she took a good stab at it. It was just, just happened to be off target, but, um, yeah, I think both of those players have really, um, really backed up the faith that, that Vera had in them coming into this game, as well as Savannah McCarthy in defence as well, the Galway uh, centre half, um, her first competitive appearance as well, and she was absolutely brilliant. Um, so the, the the three of them, um, and I wouldn't say question marks the same as yourself, but um, certainly they, they wouldn't have been automatic starters um, at the end of the last campaign, and they the three of them really, really did themselves proud and I think um, have have kept their places for the game on Tuesday. And what about the tactical approach to that game against Finland? Will it be the same as it was last night of sitting deep and going on the break or will Vera Pau change it up a little bit? Because the thing with Finland is they're not Sweden, but they're still above us in the rankings. They'd still be a class above us. Yeah, they would play a similar style. Obviously, Scandinavian players, um, not to stereotype them, but they all play in each other's leagues. They play similar enough styles. They're, they're all well coached. There's an awful lot of investment uh, in each of those countries. So, and um, we spoke about it on Monday in terms of, uh, the, the Iceland and Denmark games, which have been, you know, a similar, similar style opposition as well. Um, so yeah, it'll be a similar enough test. Uh, Finland aren't as good as Sweden. Um, they don't have the talent that Sweden do. So I think there will be a bit more of an offensive um, an offensive approach, I suppose, uh, even though it's away from home. Um, basically, what the way they lined up today was a more a loose 3-4-3, three, 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 which can fairly easily fall back into a 5-4-1, which it did for an awful lot of that game, purely because Sweden were putting so much pressure on. I think there will be a bit more flexibility in the same formation on Tuesday, purely because the the Finns won't put as much pressure on us. There will be more opportunities to to keep the ball in the opposition half. And I think maybe having... um, the move that was made on on Thursday night to bring Kate McCabe up from wing back to the forward line, I think that will continue, and I think that will that will provide more of an attack and impetus. But um, certainly, I I think they'd be similar enough teams. I mean, they're Sweden as as good as they are as you know Olympic runners up, second uh, ranked team in the world, top ranked team in Europe. Um, as good as they are, they don't have the sort of game breakers that you'd say a team like Denmark has. The there's no Pernilla Harder in there. There's no um, with Germany. There's no Jennifer Marajan in there. There's no kind of player who can produce something a little bit different out of nothing. So they were quite quite predictable, um, and I think Finland will be a similar sort of way. They they will play a fairly structured game. Um, They'll use the little bit of physical advantage that they have. They'll, you know, but be quite, quite by the numbers, quite, um, quite predictable. And I think Vera Pau has shown this game that she had that figured out for Sweden. And I think it'll be the same situation on Tuesday. But always going away from home, it's a different game than it is at home. It's always going to be a little bit tougher to, the. I suppose with with the right two way crowd, the momentum is always a little bit different. But I definitely think um, the same approach with maybe a little bit more of the shackles loose loosened. Um, I think that could work well, and I would be having seen this performance. I'm a lot more confident going into that game than I would have been three days ago. Okay, well let's talk about matters domestic. The extra dot ie FAI Cup semi finals taking place tonight. I think you're going to Richmond Park for St. Patrick's Athletic against Dundalk. So we'll start with that one. The big question is, will Patrick Hoobin be fit? If he's not, it is an incalculable loss for Dundalk. I've watched Dundalk up close an awful lot recently. And Hoobin is actually even better than he gets credit for. Uh, exactly. And I think he's been a huge part of their their little renaissance they've had in the past few weeks, um, particularly his reliability in front of goal. You know, when you get a penalty, you don't have to worry about Patrick Coombe. Um And yeah, I, I, I think that'll be a huge one, particularly with, you know, David McMillan has uh, 
uh, has, hasn't played an awful lot of football as well. There's a, there's a little bit of a, um, something missing in attack for them there. So I think, um, yeah, that'd be a huge one. I do, my own personal opinion, I just think in a, in a one off game, all the pressure's on Dundalk. Uh, Pats are more or less confirmed for Europe. I don't think they need the cup. So they can go out there with a bit less pressure. They can just go out and play their natural football. Know that it's going to be a bonus if they get to a cup final. And I think with, with teams like Pats, you always see it with the, you know, the, the, the big continental teams, you know, the, the Germanys or the Brazil or wherever. When the pressure is off, that's when they play their best football. And I think Pats are a similar sort of way. And I just have a little inkling that um, the fact that, you know, they're so comfortable in the league, they can come into this game just with a bit of pressure off. Dundalk have all the pressure on them. I think that might just feed into Pat's hands and I I would expect, well, maybe not expect, but um, my opinion going into the game would be that um, they will be the ones who will emerge victorious. Have Dundalk not responded well to pressure though in the last couple of weeks? Like they've produced some of their best performances under pressure. Absolutely, yeah, and particularly you, obviously the the most obvious one is the is the Shamrock Rovers game a couple of weeks ago, um, but that's that's always just a bit of a weird fixture in general. Dundalk always seem to have the number on on Rovers when they're doing better than them, and maybe vice versa at times as well. Um, but yeah, I think the pressure going into this game it really depends on if they can put a full strength lineup out, um, if they can if they can play their football. I just don't I'm not entirely sure if it's not the same as the pressure that's been on on them in the league. I think at this point Dundalk need to win the cup to get into Europe. And for the club, um the 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 financial I suppose implications for the club are so big. It's it's gonna be a very a very interesting week for Dundalk. And but, but I again, wondered I wonder Dave, do the do the players feel that because so many of them won't be there next season. What do they care about that pressure? The pressure on them is all about the football. So maybe we're getting kind of confused in, uh, on who's under pressure here. Uh, is it the Dundalk hierarchy who are trying to sell the club and know that if you're in Europe, it's a far more attractive proposition? Or is it the squad, many of whom are very uncertain about who they'll be with next year, with the exceptions of obviously McElhenney and Duffy, who are on their way to... Um, to Derry, Patrick Hoogan is being linked with the move. There's talk of Linfield. There's actually talk, coincidentally, of Pats. He's the kind of guy that I'd say he could walk into any League of Ireland club and, and they'd give him a contract right now. So in, in some ways, it, it, is the pressure argument a, a little bit misleading? Okay, well, you've undermined my entire point there. Thank you. Um, but, <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry, no, but I, I was just kind of thinking about it all week. That like, God, this is their last hurrah for a lot of these players. But maybe that in itself is pressure. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I think you've confused me with so many words now that I just don't know what I think anymore. But uh, no, I, I, I do think like um, the, the players you mentioned, the Duffy, McElhenney, um, the, they're all, already gone already. But uh, I think uh, for a lot of the players, they will still be playing for contracts. They will still be uncertain about where they are next next year. Um, and I, I do think that brings a, brings a pressure on it as well. But yeah, that, as you said, uh, Perhaps none of the players in that squad uh, know if they'll be at Dundalk next year. So maybe, maybe that will take some of the pressure off. And maybe, maybe that will kind of help them in that way. But um, I think certainly Vinnie Perth will be here, will be feeling the pressure, and it's it's a big week for him um, in in terms of how he prepares the squad. But um, I, may, maybe not so much in the the pressure on Dundalk, but I think certainly the pressure is off uh, Pats, yeah. and I think uh, you. As much as they have a few injuries, and um, they've had to kind of dig into their under nineteen squad this year, I do think this is kind of a not a free hit because I I don't think they're underdogs by any stretch, but I do think that you know they can go out there, they can express themselves, and I think that that's that's kind of when a team like Pats play their best play their best football. Do you know what we should do on this podcast? Say pressure more. Yeah, <laughs> pressure is actually- retired. I think you actually made a great point there about players being uncertain and maybe that puts pressure on them because they want to get contracts elsewhere and such. Uh, Let's move on to Bowles against Waterford. I I think it's a really hard one to call. 
and I, I, I and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong and I don't know if you've been following it, but I certainly haven't because I've been busy in my day job uh, this week. So I haven't really followed the build up. Georgie Kelly didn't play on Monday night in the Dublin Derby. Uh, James Talbot got a knock in the warm up. But I wonder if if that was the cup semi-final, would they have played him? And was it a case of them just saying, you know what, let's not risk him. Let's not risk Georgie. Or are they actually doubts for the game tonight as we speak? Bowls are kind of a funny hear, place going into it. Yeah, I didn't hear I didn't hear otherwise, put it that way. Um I I haven't heard anything to suggest that they are, you know, um serious doubts for the game. Um as you said, I Friday t- today is the big game for, for Bowls at the moment. Um as big as the Dublin Derby is, it's not as big a game at the moment. So um I, I yeah, I, I I think if if the games have been reversed, I think um a knock in the warm up could have been could have been uh, smoothed over. But I, I do think um, in the in the case of Kelly, I know he has been carrying a little something and maybe it was just the best thing for him to uh to sit it out and be ready for, for the the you know, the, the pivotal game on the weekend. And uh yeah, I have to put in a word for Promise on area as well, uh, who came in for Georgie Kelly and was absolutely magnificent um, against Rovers. He hasn't had an awful lot of opportunities, but, uh, you know, he, he did brilliantly. His touch, his uh, awareness was brilliant. And, of course, he uh, he was going to force that red card in that game as well. So, um, you know, if, if there is any doubt over Georgie Kelly, I wouldn't be massively worried based on what I saw on, on Monday night. Yeah, I watched Promise against Dundalk last Friday and he was he was a really lively presence and they weren't overly amazing in that game Bose, but they did play until the end they did get a deserved penalty and um, they are still very much in the hunt for Europe through the league but this is a good route for them as well and wouldn't it be great for them if they could win a cup after what has been a, a strange season great in the sense that they did wonderfully well in Europe and you look at Pauk now and you realise how good they are and you know they're uh, I don't know the detail, but they seem to be going well in Europe. Um, and it, it's just, it's a case for Bulls that <laughs> this season could be absolutely amazing or it could just kind of peter out. And a win tonight would put a deposit on it being an amazing season. What about Waterford? They're they're in good form coming into this one. Yeah, they've, I, I think a few people have sort of highlighted over the past few weeks that since Mark Bertram came in, and particularly in the last few weeks, um, they've really, really got going. I know they brought in a few experienced players from England, the likes of Greg Halford and, and a couple of others, Andrew Waterworth. And that seems to have really added, uh, added an extra dimension to what was an extremely young team. And... Yeah, they they seem to have really really settled the settled the boat there, and it's a huge opportunity for them as well. Um, coming into this game, it's they're still not out of the woods in terms of relegation. I think they they probably put enough uh, results together uh, that they can they they can feel that they can be re- reasonably confident about getting out of that. But um, this is again, a, I said free hit in relation to Pats, and how it wasn't really the right word. This is a free hit for for Waterford, and yeah, I think it's going to be. Um, they have absolutely nothing to lose, put it that way. Um, and you know, you you look back at Bowles and kind of uh, you know never having played in the in the remodeled Aviva before this season, three games, three wins against top top class European teams. Um, how great it would be for them to get to the Aviva and you know have all those good memories already in the bank and and the confidence that, that brings them, um, you know uh, how how pleased would Waterford be if they could completely just upset that apple cart and and go out and set up a final with her, you know either Dundalk or Pats, which uh, I don't think they'd be hugely scared of either side either if they if they got to the final. And Waterford fans will tell you that if they do get to the Aviva or Lansdowne Road as it used to be known. There better only be one ball on the pitch this time. I'm not sure if you get the reference. I'm not sure if you're too young, but those of you who are old like me will know exactly what I'm referring to there. The uh, FA Cup uh, final against Longford, where there was two balls on the pitch and Longford got a goal. Um, Dave, just before I let you go, Liverpool taking on Manchester United over the weekend. Um, I heard Paul Scholes say that if United play like they did against Atalanta, and if they set up like they did, 
against Atalanta, Jurgen Klopp will be delighted. Yeah, I I've been watching Man United for the last three years. My my, my whole family are Man United fans, and I've been telling them over and over again, Man United are the they're the best awful football team I've ever seen in my life. They have such amazing talent, and they use it so so badly. But it seems to always kind of work out for them somehow in these big games. The game against Atlanta the other night, it was just baffling. They were so, they should have been out of sight. They should have been four or five down. And somehow they score, what, three goals in 13 minutes and win the game. It was just, it it just sums up that team. It's their, it, it's sensible soccer. Um uh, you, you you mentioned that you're you're um, you're an old person. I think I just stated myself there as well. It's just complete, you know, uh, tactics out the window. Nothing makes sense. Just send players out and just say, you know, just go out there and have fun. And that's what Man United seem to do. They just seem to go out there. There's no there's no logic to how they go and play, but they it seems to work out. And <laughs> I I wouldn't be hugely surprised if they went out and beat Liverpool. But it's I equally wouldn't be surprised if they lost if they lost six or seven nil. It's just that kind of weird one. And uh yeah, so my my prediction is that I don't have a clue. <laughs> okay. Dave Donnelly of extratime.com. Thank you very much for joining us on the extratime.com Friday podcast. Anytime. This is the extratime.com Friday podcast. And we're joined now by all Ireland winner with Ballyhale Shamrocks and Kilkenny Colin Fenley. Colin, how are you? I'm good, Austin. Very good. Good. What was your reaction during the week when you saw your former club manager and club teammate, and of course former county teammate Henry Shefflin, had taken the role as Galway manager? It was a huge shock. Um, I think it was a huge shock for everyone, um, especially since probably the day before we seen that. Uh, Davy Fitz was a, a shoe in for the job. I actually thought he had it in all. Um, and then to see Henry's name pop up, it was a, it was an interesting one. Um, and as well as that, probably I wasn't even too sure if it was true, just between just the whole distance thing as well, straight away. Like, you know, you, you think that'd be a huge problem. But um, but um, Galloway are um, extremely fortunate um, to certainly nail him down and they must have said all the right things. He went from being your teammate to your manager at club level. What was he like as a manager? Yeah, I, mean, I remember that time was actually interesting enough to see because it was quite quick. It was straight away the year after he retired. Um, he didn't actually get to play out that much the previous year because of injuring that. Um, and we weren't too sure what way that would work. But um, Henry, as a player and all that, was, he was always within himself. He knew exactly what was going on. Um, and he was very professional about how he did things. And as well as that, then as soon as he became manager, he was very professional how he did that. Um, and just to take, change over for him was just so easy. He was a manager and uh, he he called the shots and that was it. He was um, he was a very, good, very, very good manager. Um, and you could see just how he improved himself over the two year period that he was with us. Um, just on how he went about looking at other teams, tactics, all those small little things that you'd see happening. Um, and just him coming in for us as manager, I suppose, what was a huge thing alone with the club. Um, and he's had brought bringing in such huge success, both as a player and a manager. Um, and we, we were delighted to have him. And obviously, we're very lucky um, as we won two All Ireland with him. Is he uh, get down into the trenches and do all the coaching manager, or is he a kind of a delegate, sit back and make the decisions from a kind of a removed position? manager now th- that might change depending on what way he feels he needs to do things in Goy but w- with you what was he like it was actually a bit of both um he has Richie O'Neill with him with us actually and um he has him again with Galway and he has his brother Tommy Shefflin um with us as well so we're quite fortunate that we've had three very good guys over us that were both well able to train and well able to manage um so whenever he had to take a training session he took it um uh, and you know things were serious when he was taking a training session um, but um, Tommy and Richard were very very good training wise so they were and they had us probably in ideal con- condition and I suppose the thing with Henry was lucky for us that he he's so in touch after just retiring he knew when lads retired 
He knew when lads were overtrained. He knew how, when to have meetings and when not to have meetings, not to drag him out when he when he knew when he needs to go through teams in depth um, and how long it took. He, he'd always let us know. Um, as well as that, like he'd always give us a training schedule and let us know in time. So we were able to plan around things or even our own social life. Like, you know, so it's, it's all those things that he was very good as a manager. Um, and, you know, he, he has good lads around him, which, which I, I'm sure he'd probably make sure to bring to Galway with him. I remember talking to him after either the first or second AIB All-Ireland club title. And he said that in the early stages of his management, he was a bit too lively on the line. He nearly forgot to remove himself. But as uh, the Kilkenny club championship went on, as the Leinster club championship went on, he kind of removed himself a bit and was a calmer presence on the sideline. A bit like Jim Gavin, who barely moves. Sometimes you feel like you need to prod him to make him make sure he's still alive. But is that the kind of... Does he kind of project a coolness onto the field as a manager? And again, he did this with Bally Hale Shamrocks, but it might be different with Goy. But with Yee, he seemed to he seemed to know when to react and how to react on the sideline. Yeah, I'm mean, sure as a player, it was probably hard to take himself away from it. Um, you know, and he fell into that role then quite well throughout the two years. Um, and yeah, no, he is cool and calm on the line because he had to make changes. Um, in games um, and obviously he made all the right changes because because we, we did very well um, so so he is quite cool uh, and collective on the line uh, and as well as that in the dressing room at half time um, he'd take that bit of time for us to talk to ourselves and then he'd come in and he'd be very straight to the point with what the plan is and what we have to do and where we were and uh, you know it, it just just made a huge difference when we always had to go out that second half Um that we knew exactly what we were doing. And the fact that he's Henry Shefflin as well, that that in itself is a currency, isn't it? He walks into a room, he has instant respect, no matter where in the country he is. Yeah, and that's it. Like, I, I, And the thing is, you know, if I was a, a Galway supporter, a player, you know, you'd be very, very excited to have Henry up there. Um, like he, he was a great player. Um, he, he is a great manager. He, you know, I've experienced that. Um, I, I see what he does in the line. Um, and, you know, we, we had the best of him, so we did. And he's only getting, going to get better. He's with Thomas down there now at the moment. And, you know, it's just, it's just a great move for him. I suppose going to Galway was a great move for, for Galway um, to have him. And um, certainly for the players, um, there'll just be huge, huge excitement there, I've no doubt. OK, well... The Sunday game's loss is very much Galway's game. Colin Fenley, thank you very much for joining us on the extratime.com Friday podcast. And uh, the best of luck to you and Ballyhale Shamrocks for the rest of the championship. No problem. Cheers, Oshin. This is the extratime.com Friday podcast. And as we speak, we're standing on the pitch in Parnell Park following Castle Knox Go Ahead Dublin Senior Football Championship quarterfinal playoff win against Ballantyre St. John's. Graham Hannigan's with me. Graham, that was, um, despite what the scoreline might suggest, a hard fought win. Yeah, hard fought win. Um, Volunteer have uh, taken us now twice this year, so we just wanted to put it up against them and we sort of owed them one there. And we, uh, we thought we left it behind us in Vinnie's when we played Vincent's in the um, last group game. So we thought six points got us over the line, but it didn't in the end. So um, yeah, it was nice to get the win now and Volunteer are a good side, so um, it was good to get the win over them. It was an unusual occasion, wasn't it? Probably your first time ever to play a game like this because the way it worked was you couldn't be separated in the group between match points and head-to-head and score difference. So you had to do a playoff, which was much better than drawing lots. Yeah, and like for myself, and we have a few injuries at the start of the year. So we went to Croaks, we're missing about five lads. So an extra game, we're actually happy to get an extra game out of it. But um, yeah, we're all set now for Sunday and hopefully we can give uh, Bal- uh, Bally Bowden a good run for their money now. Is there a worry that while well, it's good to have games, this extra game might tire the bodies a bit or is that actually a good thing to have a game then a bit of a gap maybe what is it till Sunday and then you're into that um, yeah like a break would be uh, a nice a, a nice part now but we're looking forward to Sunday there's there's what four days uh, to go so we'll recover tomorrow uh, hopefully train on Friday and just do a bit of uh, tactical work to try and see what, how we get on against Bowden but um, yeah like we're not complaining we're happy to still be in championship and give it a good uh, lash on Sunday is that the disadvantage, the fact that you don't get that time to do the tactical work, the the actual kind of planning side of things? Um, yeah, probably uh, it's a bit short notice for ourselves that we would normally do homework for about a week on, on um, our opposition. But um, 
I think we're all experienced there. There's a nice experience in our team and some uh, fresh new lads coming through. So, um, yeah, tactics-wise, um, our management's well able to um, tell us what we need to do and we'll do our homework ourselves in, um, at night time and things. So it's, uh, all, all systems go for someday. You always get your lessons done. You always do your homework. Um, there's a few young lads on this team who weren't there in 2016. They would have been kids. Sen and Forker, Connor Chalk, to name just two. Alex Watson, another one. Um, what have they added to this group? Um, like everyone says they add a bit of hunger so um, over the last few years we're probably waiting for them to come through and they've come through now there's no pressure on them they're allowed to play football they've all been around minor and 20 squads with Dublin so um, yeah they're bringing freshness into the squad and um, they're hungry for the places and they deserve their spots on the team because they're uh, showing well for balls and they're well able to take tackles so yeah all the best to them and hopefully they continue on Do they bring the hunger or is it the older guys because they're young so they think Asher look we have time this will happen eventually but for the older guys like yourself the more experienced guys you know having got to a final and having not got back since you cannot take it for granted nothing is a given in this life especially in football especially in the Dublin Championship yeah like the Dublin Championship is so competitive uh, we were we got there in 2016 and got to a final and from then on we didn't get out of our group the last two years um, or sorry we got to a quarterfinals and fell at the quarterfinal stage so um, yeah there is hunger there that we want to um get back to where we think we should be and challenge them for titles and um, the younger lads are coming through winning minor titles with, with the club um, underage so and we have the experience coming through as well so hopefully we have a nice balance between the two And how important is it that that 2016 wasn't a one-off that you've actually built around it uh, the senior team has improved and you have a lot of good young players coming through so the club is in a strong place it's not just about the senior team Yeah absolutely like geez, our second team's flying as well they're um, they're in the uh, junior quarterfinals on Sunday as well. So like they're driving through as well. They're pushing our team on. There's some lads in that second team that'd be on our squad if, if they weren't going so well. So uh, yeah, as a collective, the club is, is moving in the right direction and hopefully we can keep building. We have a few more years left enough for some of the older lads, but uh, hopefully we can put a platform there for the younger lads to push through and hopefully challenge for titles uh, in the near future. And just before I let you go, when this goes out, it'll be Friday morning. What's your build up to a game? Do you not think about it? Do you constantly think about it? Do you want your family and friends or partner or whatever to not talk about it? Do you want them to talk about it constantly? Do you watch? What do you do? How, what's your personal build up? Uh, well, I'm always da- curious about this. Uh, uh, yeah. my, my dad's a selector, so he's over there <laughs> carrying <laughs> the ball. So, uh, and we work together as well. So it's uh, pretty much full on that um, we would talk football in, uh, day and night. But um, my, own, like, my own build up, I just do my homework when I need to on a man marking job or how I'm going to get forward as much as I can and uh, yeah partner and the rest of the family sort of know when I'm a bit anxious for a game or I'm looking forward to a game and I try and just keep my head clear and see how we get on and hopefully yeah we come out on the right side like tonight and sure we're all looking forward to now to Sunday and it's quarterfinals we haven't been there in about two years so um, we're looking forward to it now Yeah I'm looking forward to doing that for Dubs TV Graham. it's really cool so thanks for hanging around after the match best of luck Thanks a million Thank you I was wearing a full on winter jacket and a scarf and I was still cold in Parnell Park so I can only imagine how Graham Hannigan felt talking to me after the match while wearing just you know O'Neill shorts and a GA jersey he was kind of turning blue by the end of it right it's time to talk about the extra.ie FAI Cup semi-finals there's two of them on tonight Bohemians against um, Waterford and St. Patrick's Athletic taking on Dundalk why the two of them are scheduled concurrently I don't know I think everyone is missing out through this um, Gavin Pierce joins me now. Gavin, um, how are you? I'm good, yeah, I'm good. Good. Just recovered from injury. Yes, and you had training tonight, with, or last night, I should say, with Warren Point. How is the recovery yeah. going? Because you're, you're, you're back on the field after a long delay. Yeah, yeah, uh, just back. I came on there last week in the Cup against uh, like a, a League Cup sort of uh, thing. It was uh, our Atlanta Senior Cup, if you were saying equivalent to that up there um, I came on for 40 minutes and then I played again in the League Cup uh, on during the night there and we won 5-2 and I got 90 minutes in that so uh, coming back uh, slowly but um, just have to be careful with it because I don't ever want to have that injury again What was the injury and how did you get it? Uh, I had a slip disc in my back um, just I jumped for a header and it just popped out and uh, my body was all off shape. It was uh, sticking out, putting a lot of pressure on my nerve and had me, uh, you know, in, in a lot of pain. And had you ever got a long-term injury in your career before that? Or was this relatively new to you at a relatively late stage in your playing career? 
No, I was unfortunate enough to do my ACL in the 2013 Cup final in the last five minutes. Yeah. Um, done, done that then, so I was out for eight months with that. Um, that wasn't as bad because it was just literally your knee, you snap the knee and then you get the operation and you're on your rehab. But with this, it was like just I was playing through it at first and uh, taking I got injections and just I wasn't getting any better. And, you know, I had to go and see a, a specialist and he recommended surgery. So um got that done. And ever since then, it's been OK and been building it up. And thankfully, back on the pitch um, and I was still a bit tender where the scar is and that mobility wise. But, you know, it's better than being in pain. I imagine it was a tough decision because, and I don't think you'll mind me saying this, you're closer to the end of your career than you are at the start. So maybe you thought, you know what, if I can manage this for a season or two, then I can get it looked after. I just, I just don't want to miss any football now. Whereas it sounds like it just, it just came to a head and you had no choice. Ah, I tried to play and just, uh, I got three injections, but it just wasn't getting any better. It was getting worse and it was affecting my sleep and affecting daily life. So I had to get the, the surgery, you know. Um, and ever since then, it's been okay, touch wood. And, you know, I hopefully never want to see that uh, pain again. Yeah, well, hopefully you won't see that pain again. <laughs> you mentioned there in 2013, you did your ACL in the cup final. Yeah. Now, that was a, a positive day in a result sense. Uh, yeah. in a sense that obviously you beat Sly- uh, Drogheda United by three goals to two you were playing for Sligo at the time people say when a player picks up an injury in such a game you know what this is the time to do it end of the season your team wins uh, there's a bit of glory in it is there any truth to that or was doing it then just as bad as doing it at any other stage did the fact that you collected a medal collected a trophy the day you did it give you any yeah. consolation yeah um, I suppose there was a few factors in it. Like I was lucky enough to sign a new contract two weeks previously. Um, so that was a bit of security for me. If I had done it and I wasn't in contract, it might have been a different story, uh, you know. But that's the way it happened. That's, that's the way it happened. So thankfully I had that security. I obviously had kids to, to feed and that, and bills to pay. So that helped me in a way. I managed to, uh, I was able to get my uh, rehab done properly and take my time with it. And I was quick enough coming back. Uh, eight months is relatively quick enough, I think. Uh, looking at others, there's normally nine to 12 months. Um, got back playing. Uh, we won the trophy, yeah. Uh, I partied. I did and did. Uh, but then, <laughs> I suppose a few days later, I I. I I looked down and my, my leg was all swollen because uh, I've obviously been out since the, the, the final for a couple of days and travelling back or whatever. Uh, and then I said to myself, right, it's time to get into re- to sort of rehab mode now and get off that and get myself right, yeah. um, which I did. And, you know, I was in for, I had to get my leg straight for four weeks. And once that was done, in for the operation and knuckled away with the, the rehab. But I suppose it's not a nice injury because the long-term effect of it, like it affected my game coming back and I suppose I lost a lot of pace, um, mobility, movements, you know, where you'd normally push off and, and take, um, sorry, can you hear me, yeah? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Oh, yeah, sorry, my phone, right? uh, you'd normally push off and quickly you'd, you're, you're thinking of the movements and you're afraid to, to go in on them. I remember playing it with Sligo when I just, uh, the year after I come back and, Jamie McGrath was running at me and normally like I'd, I, I knew what he was doing but I took I, I took two extra steps because I was afraid of turning so sharp and he managed to get away and get a shot up and they scored from it so just little things like that sort of makes you doubt yourself in, in the game situations people don't really see that they just think oh he's fit now but it does affect you uh, I suppose physically and mentally Yeah well I, to be fair to you Jamie McGrath has made a mug of many people even if they're 100% fit. So don't feel too bad about that. Uh, come here, just before we move on to the uh, ah, yeah. matches this weekend in the Cup semi final yeah. tonight as we speak, you're in Warren Point now. You're working with John Gill. Uh, I think Luke Wade Slater and a couple of other uh, former League of Ireland uh, guys are yeah, up there. Right. It's, it's, right smart, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a real kind of... Um, <laughs> it's a, it seems to be a, a really good group up there. Yeah, yeah it's grand. Uh, not doing too well at the moment, but uh, hopefully... Uh, I can get fit and help out there using my experience, but um, yeah, it's, it's grand. It suits me at this, as you said, I'm, I'm on the other side of the the, the line now, nearly. Um, it suits me to coming towards the end of my career and 
it's close to Dublin. Um, I suppose it's out of the league. Uh, it's just it's picking up. Like I suppose I enjoyed playing Torn, won a trophy there, a cup there, and then uh, came down here because I wanted to stay part time. They were going more full time, but yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I've been the injury hasn't helped it, but uh, hopefully now I put that behind me and help them out. Yeah, well, look, it's it's good to see you on the pitch. Um, let's talk about the cup semi-finals tonight. It is a competition you are more than familiar with, having won it three times. Firstly, what's it like in the lead into a semi-final? Is it is there nearly more of a fear factor going into a semi-final than there is a final? Because no one remembers set beaten semi-finalists. And as Alan Matthew said to me a couple of weeks ago, after uh, Pat's defeat to Shamrock Rovers, when I put it to him, look, you have a lot to look forward to, including a cup semi-final. And he said it's nearly worse to lose a semi-final. Um, what was your feeling going into the various semi-finals that you played? Yeah, uh, never really sort of doubted myself. We were going in and we had bows in the first one in 2010. And, you know, we fancied ourselves that year, to be honest with you. We had just won a cup, uh, the EA Cup, and we were we had lost the year before against Sporting Fingal in the final. So we knew what it was like getting to the final. We were hurt and... We had that mentality that it wasn't going to happen again, and we went in. It's probably the be- one of the best performances we've ever put together with a Sligo Rovers team. Uh, we absolutely battered balls that night uh, and came away vict- victorious. Let's talk about the actual games themselves. Bulls taking on Waterford in Dalymount Park. How do you see this one going? What kind of match do you think this will be? I think there'll be definitely goals in it anyway. Um, Waterford have scored a lot of goals in the last couple of games Mark Bertram he's doing a good job there um, and then obviously Keith and Trevor are doing a good job at Bowes they've slipped up a bit um, probably should be closer to Europe or in the European spots in my opinion but um, you know they've drew the last two games with uh, Shamrock Rovers and Dundalk so you know it, it, it's going to be goals I think it'll be a good atmosphere and I suppose Bowes are at home um, might help them they're used to playing on the pitch uh, they've got good experience obviously um, James Talbot called into the Irish setup. Uh, I've seen a link there later on of um, um, Ross Tierney going, linked to Motherwell they've got Dawson Devoy obviously Wardy has experience you know, they're doing well Keep Buckley has been around the block as well so you know, they're, they're doing well they are scoring themselves um, so for me I'd probably head towards Bowes being at home and um, I, I'd probably tip Bowes in that one yeah certainly they're they're going better than Waterford Waterford have gone on an upsurge since Mark Bircham has come in and they have a bit of momentum and they have also yeah. I suppose that the underdog tag is is that helpful to them? yeah uh, there's no real pressure on them they're not expected to win so they'll go in there with a bit of freedom uh, Bowes are obviously like they're probably counting on this for Europe Uh at the moment, and now I know they can probably still catch again into Europe, but it's just maybe just that little bit too far away from it. Um, but uh, they'd be looking at this to try and get into Europe, I think. Let's talk about the other game, um, St. Pat's against Dundalk. It's a, it's a hard enough one to call, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. Um, St. Pat's have done well all year. They've stayed up there in the European competitions. Dundalk, not so well. But I suppose Vinny has experience in winning trophies. Um, he's done that. He's come back in. He's picked up a couple of results now. Probably a bit of confidence in, in, in the in the team there now. Uh, then obviously the likes of Duffy and McElhaney are linked or they're signed for Derry pre contracts. Um, and they'll be looking to hopefully win a trophy and finish off on a high. So you'd like to think that would happen. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's, it's going to be a good game that one. Um, to be honest, with you, I, I couldn't put me, I couldn't pick one of them. It'll be a tight enough game. Could be a, a, a one nil to either way. Okay, Gavin Pierce, thank you very much for joining us on the Extra Time dot com Friday podcast. We didn't actually discuss tonight's games as much as I thought, but we we kind of went in, down an interesting road of talking about your own experiences in the cup and, of course, your own comeback from injury. And no doubt, Sligo fans will be delighted to hear to hear that you're um, you're on the comeback trail because you had some great days with them well that's it for the extra time.com friday podcast we're not back on monday because it's a bank holiday there is a lot happening over the weekend between uh, liverpool and manchester united the go-ahead dublin senior football championship quarterfinals there's also big games in cork actually you can check it out tonight 
I'll be commentating on Aaron's own against Middleton in the Cork Senior Hurling Championship quarterfinal. You can watch that live and for free through the Irish Examiner. Just check out their social media channels for that. I'll also probably put up a link on my own Twitter account at Oshin Lang. And there's games all over the country, not just in Cork and Dublin. I just happen to be going to games in Cork and Dublin. The Mayo quarterfinals, for example, are live on RTE TV on Saturday afternoon. TG Cahar have games on Sunday. I just, I can't remember where. Obviously, there's an awful lot happening in domestic football. Uh, we've got the FAI Cup semi-finals tonight, as has been mentioned many times. And if you want to follow everything that's happening in those, then go to extratime.com or the social media channels. Uh, remember, you can get me at any stage on at Oshin Langan. That's it. As I say, we're not back on Monday, but we are back next Friday. Until then, take care.